Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about aging and physiological responses to acute exercise. Um, so a quick overview of the aging process. Um, so as we age, our physiology changes over time. So it's very gradual. It's hardly even perceptible from day to day. Um, but over time, you see that certain things uh, gradually over time change in terms of how we respond to exercise or how we go through our lives, our strength and, and all of those sorts of things. And what changes and how much it changes or how quickly it changes depends significantly on our individual um, variables. So different genetic or biological factors. So, you know, how prone are we towards certain changes or not, depending on our genetics, um, but it's also extremely susceptible to lifestyle behaviors. So like a smoker versus a non-smoker, they're gonna have a very different physiological process of aging. Um, so how much sleep do we get? How much water do we drink? How are we eating? How much stress are we under? So all of those sorts of lifestyle behaviors and exposures are gonna have a significant effect on how each individual ages. Um, and then disease. So. Um, whether it's genetic disease, chronic disease, lifestyle related disease, things like that, um, that is going to, those sorts of things will have wear and tear on the body and it will affect the, how those physiological changes are happening with age. Um, so there's a significant amount of variation among different individuals at the same exact age. Um, now age does not tell you anything about what they should or could be doing in terms of an exercise program. We cannot make any assumptions whatsoever just based solely on age. Um, I've had, you know, 70 year old clients who have been significantly more fit and healthy than 30 year old clients that I've had. Um, I've had clients in their seventies who are doing the Ironman. Um, so age means absolutely nothing when it comes to health and fitness and ability. Um, so it's important that we, um, when we're prescribing exercise, when we're programming, that we are considering the individual and their capabilities and their history and, and their current health status. So here are the exercise recommendations. They are exactly the same for all healthy adults. Okay, age has nothing to do with it. These are the exact same exercise recommendations. Um, so if we were going to change the exercise recommendations for an older adult, it would not be at all because of their age. It would be because they maybe have cardiovascular disease or uh, if they have some other disease or osteoporosis or something that we need to consider, then we follow those recommendations. But there are no different recommendations just based on age. Because again, a 70 year old can be equally fit and healthy as a 30 year old or in a lot of cases more so. So I wanna go through some of the changes that happen with aging. And I wanna point out that this is what happens naturally over time if we don't exercise, okay? So exercise undoes this. Exercise prevents this from happening. So in somebody who's not exercising, they would experience what's called sarcopenia. So that's age-related loss of muscle mass, loss of skeletal muscle mass that accelerates with aging. So sarcopenia, what happens is we lose fibers and size of our existing fibers. So we lose type one and type two A fibers, which means that our muscular endurance is decreasing and the type two B fibers that are remaining um, get smaller in size, which means we're losing strength and power. Okay, so it's loss of muscle mass, um, but that includes loss of fibers and loss of size of our remaining fibers. Um, so the average person, if they're not exercising, loses one to 2% of their total muscle mass per year between the ages of 20 and 90. Okay, so starting at 20 years old, we are already losing one to two percent of muscle mass per year into our, you know, late life. Okay, and that's without exercise. We can prevent that entirely with strength training. If we strength train throughout life, 
we can completely prevent that. We can maintain our muscle mass and build more muscle mass as we go through life. Um, so we are not just doomed to experience sarcopenia as we go through life. And it's never too late to start. So even if somebody has never exercised a day in their life, they can still start exercising later in life to prevent further muscle loss and even to replace some of the muscle that they've lost. Um, so then this little graph here, this blue line is showing our muscle mass over a lifetime. So this is age across the bottom here. So from 20 years old to you know 90 or 100 years old here, we're seeing this just steady decline of muscle mass over a lifetime. And then this pink line is percent of body fat, which steadily increases over a lifetime. And again, that is without exercise. This is what the, the body naturally does with aging if we are more or less sedentary over most of these years. So although the person's total weight could remain the same, it might go up or down, but it could remain the same, but there's a significant transformation in body composition. Um, and then this picture over in the corner here is really telling this, um, the, both of these are a cross section um, of the thigh. And in this top picture, we're seeing the cross section of a 74 year old sedentary man's thigh. And you see that all this white part around the outside, that's all adipose tissue. And then we see the muscle that is relegated just towards the center. And it's a little bit marbleized, essentially. I hate to use that terminology in, in humans, um, but you can see that there's adipose tissue that is um, extending into that muscle tissue there too, which is an effect of, of a sedentary lifestyle. Um, and then down here is the cross-section of a 70-year-old triathlete's thighs, and this is all muscle. Okay, so you can see that it's not about age, you know, and of course, these are only two individuals and there are a lot of, there's a lot of variability even among triathletes or among sedentary people. So of course, there's a lot of variability, um, but these are pretty representative of generally speaking, what happens with age when we exercise or don't exercise and it is never too late to start. So even if somebody is this 74 year old person who's been sedentary their whole life, they still can start to exercise and, and reduce that fat and increase muscle function and, and muscle tissue. Um, so strength and neuromuscular function, again, without exercise will decline with age. Um, and as it declines with age, that interferes with activities of daily living because without sufficient strength or neuromuscular function, um, so proprioception and ability to know where we are in space and that sort of thing, uh, that interferes with our ability to just do our normal activities of daily living. So just our normal walking and moving around and doing the things that we need to do. Um, and these declines really start to manifest around age 50 to 60. So although they might have been declining for decades, they start to manifest in terms of symptoms and reduction in function around that age because they start to decline uh, to the point where it becomes a greater problem. Um, and it's really caused by the decreasing muscle mass that we talked about a minute ago, where our muscle mass is decreasing from the age of 20 onward if we are not exercising to work against that. So again, resistance training offsets this process and we don't have to have any decline if we are exercising um, over the decades, or again, it's never too late to start. Even if it's manifesting around age 50 or 60, start strength training and that will help to reverse what you're experiencing and prevent it from declining further. Okay, VO2 max, so a representation of our cardiovascular health and function. Um, so again, without exercise, um, our VO2 max declines over a lifespan. So if we look at the graph here, these red dots are representing an average person who is not exercising. So at age 15, here's average VO2 max without exercising. And then just a steady decline over the lifetime until we have very poor VO2 max starting at about age 70 and onward. Very poor, but after, you know, it wasn't great for a while before then either. 
Um, but compare that to these blue dots. Those are athletes at the same age. So here's 15 and here's 90. And look, there's still a decline with age, but it's all of these um, data points are still significantly high compared to the average. Um, so even at 90 years old, the athlete's VO2 max on average is going to be similar to what the average person's VO2 max was when they were 25 or 30. Um, so without exercise, VO2 max declines on average eight to 10% per decade up until age 70. And then after that, about 20% or more per decade after age 70 and then, and then so on. <laughs> All right, so cardiovascular training here, this is in reference to a study where all of the participants were at least aged 50. Um, and all they did was 30 minutes a day of vigorous cardiovascular exercise only three days a week. And they did it for six weeks. So that's, that's pretty minimal in the way of an exercise program. So 30 minutes, three days a week for six weeks. And these are the results that they got. So their VO2 max went up considerably their HDL cholesterol went up, and then all of these other markers went down. So total cholesterol, triglycerides, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, body fat and blood glucose all decreased with only six weeks of 30 minutes, three times a week. And that's with subjects who are 50 years old or older, um, which really just demonstrates that it is never too late. Um, so you can start at any time and get the benefits, um, of exercise. So exercise and lifespan. So there was another study, um, where they looked at people who never exercised in their lives until, um, age 45 and people started exercising at age 45 and improved from low to moderate cardiovascular fitness that added five years to their lifespan. When they improved from low to high cardiovascular fitness, that added nine years onto their lifespan. So beginning exercise, even if it's you know middle of life or later in life, is still going to add years to your life and it's gonna add quality to the rest of your life. Exercise and mental health. Uh, so here's another study where they uh, had participants who were age 50 or more who are all clinically depressed. Um, and they, they had people in different groups. We had a control group. We had a group, not we, I didn't do this study. <laughs> they <laughs> had a control group. They had a group who just did exercise, a group who just used Zoloft and a group who used exercise and Zoloft. And a higher bar here means more improvement. Um, and so what we see is at 16 weeks, that's the blue bar. So the control really didn't have any change at any follow-up. And that's what we would expect. Um, at 16 weeks, exercise had a significant improvement. Zoloft was a little more than that. And exercise and Zoloft was a little bit more than that. But then if we look at the six month follow-up, so the red bar, exercise, the exercise group was only a little bit lower than it was at 16 weeks. And it remains significantly higher than the Zoloft group and the exercise and Zoloft group. So what we see here is that in the long term, at least six months is what we can see here, um, that exercise alone was better than Zoloft or even exercise and Zoloft. So exercise alone without medication was better in at the six month follow-up. And I'm not saying if somebody has depression, they should stop taking their medication. Absolutely not needs to be under the guidance of uh, their physician. And we wanna make sure that it's safe and, and that they're being treated the way they need to. But I just wanted to illustrate the point here that exercise is very significant in improving depression. And this study was in um, you know, individuals who are 50 years old or older, um, but you see similar results to this in, in basically all age groups and demographics. All right, so when working with um, an aging population, whatever that means relative to the person you're, you're working with, um, there are a few things to keep in mind. One is the intensity. You want it to be challenging, just like you would for anybody, uh, but it especially needs to be safe, just like you would for anybody. 
Um, but you want to consider some specific safety issues with the, an aging population. Um, so one is how is their balance and do they have any history of falls? Um, so falls are predictive of future falls. Um, and so if they have a history of falls, then you need to especially be careful with um, any kind of balance aspects or, or stability issues, or you want to be careful about how you select the exercises that you do with them, and especially the homework that you might give them for in between sessions when they're working with you, because uh, you do not want to put them at risk of falling. Um, consider bone density. So they may not know their bone density. Not everybody is tested for bone density until they break a bone or have some kind of problem that would indicate it. Um, and so be aware that they may have low bone density and not know it yet um, if they have if they've been more or less sedentary or don't have a, a history of of exercise or weight bearing activity. Um, or they also might have diagnosed osteopenia or osteoporosis. So consider that in the, what you're choosing. Um, if again, if they've been more or less sedentary, then realize that their muscular strength might be depleted. And so then you want to really focus on that and um, be careful in terms of um, what type of, of exercises that you choose, because if their muscular strength or um, neuromuscular function is, is lessened, um, then that could make certain exercises not very safe. Also consider that um, with age, we have greater incidence of different chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease and diabetes and other things. Um, so make sure that you're considering those comorbidities um, if they have them and that you're following the appropriate recommendations. Um, but again, age does not at all tell us their health status and so they might be able to, to have a very intense, very challenging program that your 35 year old client couldn't engage in. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then motivation is really important for you and me and them and everybody we work with. Um, so make sure that you set goals and that you are tracking progress towards those goals to show improvement. And that really goes for everyone because that's how we stay motivated. Uh, who's motivated to keep going if we don't know where we're going or why or whether we're getting there. Um, so that's very important for everybody, but in an aging population where they might be feeling a little bit discouraged or unmotivated, um, that can be a really great way to help motivate. Um, and then support. So in general, people are healthier when the people around them are also healthy. So healthy people help other people be healthy too. And you as their healthcare provider of whatever variety or type that may be, you are one of the biggest supports in your client's life or in your patient's life, depending on the environment that you're working in. Um, so 90% of individuals fail on their diet or exercise plan without individual support of qualified caring professional. Um, and that's you. So if you're their trainer or their nutritionist or their physical therapist or whoever you might be to them, that is you. You can be that supporting, qualified, caring professional that helps keep them on track and supports them on their mission. Um, and that's what's going to keep them motivated and keep them making progress towards the goals that you set with them. All right. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.